phone also with my airtel connection yes so sir just uh, either it to yeah, my phone yeah. and uh, i'll use the internet through airtel so if there is any disconnection in the line yeah let me know and i'll just immediately switch over to my phone so any problem in the internet i will give a phone call to you sir that may happen from sure, our side sure. also i sure, sure. Uh, there is internet issue from our side also sir so anything happens a disconnection i will give a, a phone call over the mobile sir okay sudhir i understand okay sir so it looks uh, quite okay right now yes sir and uh, um, shall i just uh, log off now or shall i just uh, mute my audio and video what do you suggest today sir uh, you be there only uh, but you can mute audio and video and you can come back at around uh, uh, 9:55 or 10 o'clock sir yeah i know i'll come 5 uh, minutes before itself so it's about 9:37 now yes sir uh, i'm just thinking uh, uh, i mean would it be okay for me to reconnect later that's what i'm thinking uh, uh, no, just sir. keep the uh, connection on i request you sir not to because there might be some uh, again login issues later on you never know so please uh, don't log off sir just uh, okay, turn off sure. uh, turn off uh, video and audio sir i i want you to be logged in so that sure. there should not be any issue to log in later sir okay sir i understand thank you sir sorry we'll sir hagara yeah. i will see you in about uh, 15 minutes or so that's great sir thanks a lot and i just uh, turn off my video yes sir and i'll also mute myself now okay thank you sir thank you if you want to contact me just give me a call sudhi in the next 10 sure, minutes sir. if you want to contact me just give me a call sure sir all the best thank okay. you thank you sudhi see you soon yes sir thank you
Good morning, sir. Good morning. Shall we start? Morning, Suri. Yeah. Sir, uh, our dean, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, sir, is online, sir. Ashit, sir. Good morning, sir. Nice to see you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Acharya. Good morning, sir. Nice to see you Hello, also, okay. sir. Uh, hi, Yonaki. Sir, Dr. Shivapatha, sir, sir, Vice Chancellor, sir. Shivapatha, sir, uh, our Dean, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, sir, is online, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, Good hello. morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Doc. Good morning, sir. Dr. Balak Gopal again. Dr. Ashik. Shivapatha, sir, Dr. Sir, please. Vice Chancellor. Good morning to you all. I am pro vice chancellor. <laughs> pro vice chancellor. Deputy, okay. deputy. Sir, uh, shall we start, sir? Actor, sir. Is it time? I think no. I'm, is it? I think I have to wait one more minute. Yes, sir. How many are they joined on this? Sir? How many join now? The group? Sir, on Google 63 are there, sir. Many are there on uh, YouTube, sir. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, sir. Good morning, Vanki, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Balaji, sir. Good good morning. Good morning, Sudhindra Prabhu. Good morning, Ashit. Good morning, sir. Good morning, uh, Sir Pasindram. Good oh, morning, Dean, sir. Good morning. Dean, morning, sir. Uh, one key, sir. Uh, doc, our Dean, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, sir, is online, sir. Dr. One key is the principal of uh, Bagalkot Dental College, sir. Actor, sir. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good morning, Dr. Akhtar Hussain. Good morning. Yeah, I look Perfect. for you. In fact, uh -huh. yeah. Good to have you again. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock. You want to wait? I don't mind. Or if you start, you can start. Yes, sir. Shall we start, sir? Yes, sir. A very good morning to one and all. Uh, this. Uh, Webinar of uh, Forensic Odontology is coming from uh, Center for Forensic Odontology, NFI Dental College, NFI Dean to be University of Mangalore. And uh, I would like to request, before we start, I would like to request all the delegates to turn off the microphone and the video. And if, if you cannot get access to this Google link, this uh, webinar is also available live streaming on uh, YouTube. YouTube link has been uh, uh, copied and uh, it is there available in the chat box. And now I would like to request uh, our uh, Dean, sir, Professor Dr. Akhtar Hussain, sir, to welcome the delegates. Over to you, sir. I hope this program finds you all in good health. And uh, I feel happy that uh, after we started the Center for Forensic Odontology, 
under the leadership of Dr. Sudhindra at our institution. The enthusiasm, enthusiasm seems to continue as we have another webinar today on the practical teaching of forensic odontology to dental undergraduates. And again, I'm happy because of my friend Dr. Balagopal is here with this, the president, the honorary secretary is today's resource person, Dr. Ashit Acharya, Dr. Siopata Sundaram, Pro Vice Chancellor of Meenakshi Academy of Higher Education, Office Bearers of IFO, Coordinators, Dr. Vita, Dr. Amara, delegates from all over. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. I guess it's time we stop saying that forensic odontology is an upcoming branch anymore. It's, I believe that every dental college should now. I am an oral pathologist by qualification. I am forensic dentist by passion. And as you mentioned, I am the editor of the Journal of Forensic Dental Sciences, an official organ of Indian Association of Forensic Odontology, the IAFO. IAFO was formed two decades ago by Professor J.G. Kandapan, who played a major role in the personal identification of late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. He has started IAFO in Chennai with few forensic enthusiastic with the aim of promoting forensic odontology services to government and private organization and to the individuals in need. IAFO acts as a platform for the exchange of knowledge, idea and professional experiences between the members and the stakeholders. It also encourages the research and development in the field of forensic odontology. Started with less than 10 members, now it has grown to the extent of having more than 500 members. The Nacharya and forensic odontology are two inseparable terms. This dental detective is the first forensic odontologist, qualified forensic odontologist in this country and a good friend of mine. He is instrumental in making the lawmakers, law enforcers and judiciary to be aware of the forensic odontology in India. He is a good teacher and trainer. He is known for his flawless content and its beautiful delivery in any given topic in forensic odontology. I am also eagerly waiting for his oration. Thank you very much Dr. Sindra Prabhu and Dr. Hussain for giving me the opportunity to open this forum. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. It's a really privilege to be having you uh, in our program, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay. Now, I would like to request uh, my colleague, Dr. Mikdad, uh, to introduce uh, today's resource person, Dr. Ashid B. Acharya. Over to you, Dr. Mikdad. Good morning. It is my it is my honor and pleasure to introduce the resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Ashit Acharya Sir, Professor and Head, Department of Forensic Odontology, STM College of Dental Science, Darwad. Sir doesn't require any introduction. He is a reputed academician, both nationally and internationally, for his research and casework in forensic odontology. He is the first forensic odontologist in India who established first department of forensic odontology. He served as a consultant in forensic dental cases referred by police and hospital from across India. He has 18 years of teaching ex experiences. He is a founder member of the Indian Association of Forensic Odontology and currently its secretary. He has more than 40 research papers published in international forensic and dental journals. He has contributed to government reports and chapters on forensic odontology in various textbooks. Welcome you to sir and I am over. 
Thank you. Before we start the lecture, I would like to uh, ask the delegates if any questions are there, you can put that in the chat box. Those questions will be taken up by uh, Ashish sir at the end of the session. And also, before you leave, uh, there is a feed feedback form link will be given. I request you to, uh, it will take only two minutes to answer the feedback questions. I, I want you to uh, uh, click the link uh, available in the chat box for the feedback and uh, please provide us the feedback. And this Google link is, uh, can accommodate only 100 delegates uh, logins. And if you are not able to log in through this, you can ask uh, your friends to log in through the YouTube. This is available uh, live stream on the YouTube also. Thanks a lot. Uh, over to you, Ashit, sir. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudhindra. So let me uh, share my presentation so that everyone is able to view the presentation for the day. And uh, Dr. Sudhindra, uh, I request you to confirm whether everyone is able to view the presentation. Sir, can you please uh, go to the screen? Yeah. Can you please uh, make it? Uh, yeah. Now, yes, sir. We can see the PowerPoint, sir. Yes. OK. Fantastic. Yes, sir. At the outset, uh, I thank Yenepoya Dental College, the Dean, Professor uh, Akhtar Hussain, the Center for Forensic Odontology, headed by Dr. Sudhindra Prabhu, for this initiative and inviting me to lecture on this topic. I also thank uh, the Indian Association of Forensic Odontology for allowing this program to be organized under its auspices. I'm very pleased to see our Honorable President, Professor Balgopal, the Editor-in-Chief of the official publication of the Indian Association of Forensic Odontology, the Journal of Forensic Dental Sciences, uh, Professor Shippa Sundram. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, thank you very much for your support, the IAFO's uh, support. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to see the gamut of audience here who have uh, taken the trouble to log in from across the India and perhaps uh, across the country, across India, and perhaps beyond India also. Now, uh, this topic which you see on screen, practical teaching of forensic odontology to dental undergraduates was actually suggested by Dr. Sudhindra Prabhu. And I want to clarify one thing right now, that uh, uh, what he intended was that I cover how practical exercises in forensic odontology can be taught to dental undergraduates. But how I interpreted this presentation was how teaching in forensic odontology to dental undergraduates can be done in a practical way. So you see, one title was interpreted in slightly different ways. But I'm uh, happy to mention here that uh, ultimately, not only do I plan to cover how forensic dentistry can be taught to undergraduates in a very practical manner. But at the same time, I will be including uh, how practical exercises can be taught to dental undergraduates. Uh, so uh, let me first begin with a very brief and simple definition of forensic odontology. Uh, we have uh, 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 several definitions here, but this is one definition which I think everyone will be uh, finding it easy to remember. And that is forensic dentistry is the brand. Uh, what I recall it says is that there should be a mixture of lectures, uh, which um, should uh, span both the third year BDS as well as the fourth year BDS. And there must also be a fair amount of hands-on or practical exercises. 
so the next uh, uh, maybe 50 to 60 minutes or so which i'll be talking about will largely cover not just what the dci says should be part of forensic odontology but uh, partly what i believe should be included and how it can be covered and this is of course based on my own experience of teaching in uh, both nepal where i used to work uh, about 15 16 years ago and also here in dharwad over the last 15 years so uh, in my opinion and also uh, to an extent as per the dci forensic odontology teaching should be covered in third year bds and fourth year bds and in third year it is supposed to be taught in oral pathology and in fourth year it is supposed to be covered in oral medicine and radiology now uh, in oral pathology we may include certain topics that can be referred to as preclinical in nature and in oral medicine and radiology we can include topics that are a little more core clinical in nature clinical and also radiological in nature in both uh, we can uh, divide the number of lectures equally five hours in third year and five hours in fourth year and uh, practicals also we can have about five to six hours of practicals per student in both third year as well as fourth BDS. Now let me try to expand on this particular slide and let me begin by how forensic odontology teaching can be undertaken in third BDS. And of course, as I mentioned, it has to be taught in oral pathology. And here again, to repeat, we can cover topics which may be considered as preclinical in nature. When I say preclinical in nature, we are referring to areas which have a lot of uh, relationship with dental anatomy and dental histology. So the students would have already covered and finished this in their first year. So they should be in a good position to understand these topics when it is covered in their third year. So we can begin with the one hour lecture on uh, introduction and history of forensic odontology. And uh, a second lecture also of one hour can include uh, age estimation methods, which covers both age estimation using uh, dental histology, as well as age estimation from tooth morphology. Uh, ethnic and sex differences in tooth morphology also is something that can be covered. Now, this is something which uh, was not uh, perhaps really considered to be part of forensic odontology but i believe it has quite a bit of relevance in the indian context and therefore i have uh, tried to develop this to some extent and therefore i cover this and it's also part of the pci curriculum lastly we can have lectures on bite mark investigations so one lecture related to human bite mark investigations, another lecture perhaps can cover animal bite mark investigation. The practical exercise that uh, needs to be covered should complement the theory that was taken. And uh, I do not believe that we should uh, overburden the students with too much of practical information and therefore some of the basics and most essential bits could be included here 
So age estimation is something which is extremely important in the Indian context. Therefore, we can cover uh, particularly histological age estimation, which lasts for about two to three years. And we can also cover uh, sex differences in teeth and ethnic differences in teeth, which can also span about two to three hours. Let me now uh, go into the details of what you just saw in the previous slide. So what should this one hour lecture on introduction and history include? Most importantly, it must include the proper definition of forensic odontology. And here, apart from the definition which you just saw, which is a very simplistic definition, one must also include the formal and official definition of forensic odontology, which is given by the FDI. So I uh, ensure that that's part of this lecture. And I try to dissect that definition and explain to the students in very simple terms what that definition means. Now, uh, in addition, I also highlight that forensic odontology has evolved and separated into multiple areas today. So there are different subspecialties within forensic odontology. And not just that, I think to give students uh, some context, it's important and useful to cover certain bits of the history of forensic odontology, including the history of the subject within India. And I also try to cover some of the early and prominent cases of forensic odontology from across the world. What really set the stage for the development and establishment of forensic odontology, courtesy of some of these cases. So that's as far as introduction and uh, history of forensic odontology is concerned. And of course, all these lectures would span one hour. A second lecture can be related to age estimation. And again, uh, uh, we need to cover age estimation using histology and tooth morphology. So this must uh, highlight the underlying principle of age estimation. What's the basis for estimation of age? The fact that uh, chronological age and uh, development and changes within the teeth uh, can be interrelated is what is the underlying principle. And this has to be conveyed in relatively simple terms. Uh, once this is done, I uh, uh, tell the students that basically age estimation can be divided into three categories. One is uh, methods of age estimation in prenatal and neonatal individuals. Another is age estimation in children and adolescents, which you don't see here. And that comes in the fourth year. And of course, adult age estimation. And adult age estimation methods includes the very famous Gustafsson's method. And of course, the very important Johansson modification of Gustafsson's method. And I also try to cover certain important yet simple methods. Because remember, we are dealing with third year students here. Uh, so we need to cover something that's relatively simple yet efficient. And that, in my opinion, is uh, dentinal translucency. Of course, I also cover about cemental incremental lines because many people have found this to be an excellent adult age estimation method. And it's supposed to be one of the most accurate methods of age estimation. One more relatively simple method relates to attrition, specifically attrition of molars. So you see here, there's a combination of both uh, age estimation methods that look at 
tooth morphology as well as tooth uh, histology. The third uh, lecture would uh, relate to ethnic and sex differences in the teeth. And yes, they are both combined into one one hour lecture. And uh, here, uh, since we are talking about uh, ethnic differences in tooth morphology, students must first understand what populations we are referring to. So I talk about uh, diverse population groups from a global standpoint. And then what are the different dental features that can be used in identifying global population groups. And these dental features are referred to as non-metric traits. So these are uh, features which have been studied and developed by dental anthropologists over the last century or more. And so I cover some of the basic non-metric traits. And I also try to include how these non-metric traits are applied in population identification. Coming to sex differences in the teeth, uh, I cover a definition of what sexual dimorphism is and how do we go about differentiating males from females when it comes to teeth. And that basically is by measuring the teeth. So what tooth dimensions are measured? Buccolingual and mesiodistal measurements is what we commonly use. So how do we define mesiodistal dimensions? How do we define buccolingual measurements? All of these things are covered. How do we measure the buccolingual and mesiodistal dimensions? So all of this is covered. And then what are the most sexually dimorphic tooth dimensions? And how to use it in appropriate statistical methods? And finally, because teeth are not known to give a very high rate of accuracy in sex prediction, that is a limitation. So I mentioned that also. Now it's not just uh, sex prediction from teeth that I cover, because uh, we've learned quite a bit of uh, skull anatomy as part of our first year curricula. I also include skull features that can be used in sex prediction. And what are its advantages? The advantages, of course, are that they're much more accurate than using tooth dimensions. And what are their limitations? The limitations are that they're not as strong as the teeth. Teeth are the most strong and robust structure we have in our body. So nothing comes close. So that's the advantage of using teeth. And lack of strength relative to teeth is the disadvantage and limitation of these skull and cranial features. So this was lecture number three that is covered in third videos. The fourth lecture would be on human bite mark investigation. And here again, I start off with a definition, a standard definition of uh, bite marks, not just a definition of human bite mark, but it is a definition of bite mark per se. And I proceed to the description. So uh, how do we describe bite marks? There's something called as uh, cross characteristics, class characteristics, individualistic characteristics, all of these would uh, comprise of the typical bite mark. Now, I don't go too much into classification of bite marks. And so I just limit myself to giving a very broad and basic classification. But I do go to some extent into the details of the types of bite mark injuries. 
the bite mark injuries can either present themselves as contusions or bruising they can present themselves as lacerations they can present themselves as abrasions or even avulsions avulsion is where part of the tissue is bitten off or sometimes the entire tissue may be just ripped off the body so this is also something i cover with due regard what are the common locations of bite marks the fact that bite marks are most commonly found on the breast as well as the extremities the arms and the legs and to a much lesser extent on the neck and the abdomen and the genitals so that would comprise of the common locations of bite marks but uh, most importantly from a practical point of view what is it that a recent dentist who's just graduated would need to know is how to collect evidence from the victim of a bite mark as well as how to collect evidence from the suspect in a bite mark case so i give uh, due importance to that particularly on evidence collection methods from the victim wherein we make use of photographs so how should bite marks be photographed that's something i try to give a lot of emphasis on lastly once the bite mark uh, analysis is done uh, how do we conclude our analysis what are the types of opinions that we can derive so we call it as grades of certainty of identity so what are the different grades of certainty of identity that can be derived following bite mark investigation the final lecture as far as third videos is concerned is animal bite mark investigation now i uh, acknowledge that this is something which is relatively unusual uh, but it's uh, born out of my own experience with animal bite marks both during my post graduation in australia as well as my initial years working in nepal where we used to get lots of cases of snake bites and also later having shifted to dharwad seeing that the same snake bite cases can continue in india and not just that we can have a host of other animal attacks on humans wherein bite marks may need to be investigated so i believe this would be extremely important from an indian standpoint but to undertake investigation of animal bite marks we need to have some basic idea idea about how animal dentitions look so i cover this as part of something called as comparative dental anatomy uh, you will get to see chapters on animal dentitions probably even in very common uh, dental anatomy textbooks such as wheelers i think even wolfell may have a chapter on animal dentition so i'm sure you'll get a lot of literature on this but it's important that we first start by describing some of these animal dentitions such as the uh, felines or the felidae that is the cat family the canidae that is the dog family the bear family that is the ursidae and the uh, suidae that is the pig family and also rodentia that is you know basically how do teeth of uh, rats or squirrels look because they are the largest uh, segments of mammals which inhabit the earth uh, and of course i also cover reptilian dentition how do snake dentition look the fact that uh, poisonous snakes are likely to have uh, two fangs in their maxillary dentition whereas non poisonous snakes don't have these two fangs in instead they have two rows of maxillary teeth without fangs so these are some of the interesting and important descriptions that is covered as part of 
animal bite mark investigation and i uh, uh, round off the lecture with case examples of animal bite marks and try to elicit answers from the students themselves because they've now learned a little bit about animal dentition so, so by looking at those photos of animal bite marks can they identify what animal caused those bite marks so that's how the lecture goes so this is how forensic odontology teaching of uh, the theoretical aspects is undertaken in third videos now uh, let's look at the practicals uh, now i mentioned already that age estimation is extremely important in the indian scenario and therefore i devote adequate amount of time to this covering especially exercises related to histology so you may undertake exercises related to histology or morphology and i believe the important thing is that some form of exposure is given to students at this stage now you could cover uh, practical exercises from dentinal translucency age estimation or you could cover cemental incremental lines age estimation if not dental attrition so at least one of these has to be covered again my personal choice is uh, dentinal translucency simply because at the third year level it will be very easy for students to understand and undertake of course dental attrition also is perhaps equally easy now apart from uh, uh, age estimation using these methods what's also important is the way you cover it and what i do is uh, use a mixture of manual approach as well as computer based applications uh, and i've been uh, ensuring that students bring their laptops to their practical classes and i normally request them to share a laptop computer so that one computer is available for uh, two students and they share the burden of undertaking these exercises so using these uh, uh, computer based uh, applications uh, and i say computer based applications because uh, for example translucency measurements can be undertaken digitally on the computer and they can also feed in the measurements that they have on an excel spreadsheet so instantly the age can be calculated so there is also a saving of time rather than them doing it manually everything is more or less digitized here so it makes things more interesting saves time and it is again very uh, feasible to do so apart from age estimation we also cover sex prediction from the teeth and this also lasts approximately 2 uh, hours and uh, what i do is i give the students dental models of course i know the sex of these dental models so i know whether the dental model belongs to a male or a female but the students don't and the students are not are not told beforehand whether those dentitions whether those casts belong to males or females now i have uh, several digital calipers so these digital calipers are given to the students and there are specific teeth which the students need to measure so uh, i explain to them what exactly they need to do and the students start undertaking these exercises by measuring those required teeth and then those measurements are substituted in certain sex prediction formulas and once again uh, we use a mixture of manual approach as well as the use of computer based application because again using casts and using calipers is nothing but a manual approach but then feeding in the values and undertaking the calculations is all done on an excel spreadsheet so once again that saves a lot of time and there are certain specific statistical methods that i 
employ and i explain it to the students and you'll be surprised that the students i think enjoy learning some of those statistical bits at that stage itself the final uh, practical which i cover in third year is uh, population identification from teeth and here again uh, i give the students castes dental castes and uh, they need to grade these so called non metric dental traits now remember non metric dental traits include dental features such as carabelli cusp shoveling of incisors it can even include very simple features such as the number of, of cusps on the upper second molar the number of cusps on the lower first molar number of cusps on the lower second molar they refer to as the four cusp lower molar we also have features such as uh, cusp 6 which is again on the lower first molar another feature called cusp 7 which is also on the lower first molar a feature called cusp 5 which is found on the upper first molar so these are features which are very easy for dental students to identify and analyze so many of these features are what i ask them to examine uh, on these dental casts as part of their practical exercises now what you don't see on the slide here is that i use a something called as a reference system a set of reference casts it's called as the uh, arizona state university dental anthropology system it is abbreviated as asu dental plaques so we procured these asu dental plaques about uh, 13 14 years ago from the united states and i continue to use those dental plaques as part of this exercise so anyone uh, wishing to undertake this exercise i believe should have uh, these asu dental plaques but it's not just about identifying and appreciating these dental features what's also very important is how ultimately identification of these dental features translates to identifying the population and that is where once again i use certain interesting statistical methods and all of these are prefed into an excel spreadsheet and i have given it to the students and they just have to enter the values in a proper way in a particular way and that gives them an idea as to whether that cast belongs to one population or the other so all in all i think uh, the students are getting exposure to something very different something very unusual something very unique and definitely a total departure from what they are conventionally learning in their pds so this is as far as practical teaching goes in third pds so let me now uh, jump to forensic odontology teaching in the fourth pds again as mentioned earlier this should be covered in oral medicine and radiology and as i mentioned earlier what we are talking about here is clinical ages some may also refer to it as paraclinical forensic odontology now why i refer to it as clinical forensic odontology is because there is much more uh, application here on uh, individuals per se as in we need to undertake clinical examination of the teeth and not just rely on tooth morphology or histology but actually look at a person's dentition so that clinical experience and clinical exposure is essential and therefore if we would have undertaken this in third year especially when the third year bd students have just entered the clinics i believe they may not be able to undertake these exercises very efficiently and they may not appreciate the nuances of these exercises so i think fourth year is a much better time to undertake these exercises and of course you'll also notice 
it includes uh, radiographic age estimation methods. So it's for the same reason. Students would have completed one year of clinical postings in their third year. So they have gained some minimum exposure to clinics and other investigative methods and therefore they may be in a much better position to appreciate radiographs in their fourth year. So I think it will be counterproductive to undertake these exercises when the student is in third year. Yeah, I think it must be covered in fourth year, if not even later. Now, uh, apart from the lectures, the practicals include a simulated post-mortem dental identification, which lasts about two to three hours. And also radiographic dental age estimation, once again lasting about two to three years. So let me now go into the details of this, beginning with the lectures. Comparative dental identification. World over, I think people will just refer to this as dental identification or post-mortem dental identification. But I've used the word comparative because it involves a comparison of post-mortem data with anti-mortem data. I'm sure many of you have heard these terms where post-mortem means after death, anti-mortem means before death. So comparing these two sets of data is why we refer to it as comparative dental identification. So these are the procedures that would be undertaken following, for example, an air crash when the bodies are badly damaged or burned and one can't really identify the person by looking at their face. We rely on dental records. So the forensic dentist would examine the teeth of the dead body and compare that information with what is written in the dental records or the radiographs which were taken when the person was alive. So here again, we need to cover a definition for what uh, post-mortem dental identification means. That it's, you know, the sum total of all characteristics in the dentition, which while not unique individually, equal a unique totality. Now also it's important to, to cover why identification of the dead is required. What's the basis for dental identification? The fact that uh, we all have a very unusual and unique set of teeth. That needs to be highlighted. What are the steps involved in comparative dental identification? Step number one is post-mortem examination. Step number two is collection of dental records. Step number three is comparing the two and step number four is to form an opinion. And the opinion that we form includes the different grades of certainty of identity. As in, are we sure that it is that person? Or do we have any doubts in our mind? If so, we say probably. Or we can't be sure that it is, nor it isn't. So we may say that can't be excluded. So it's not just a black and white yes or no answers that we give in such cases. The answers are, you know, a variety. And that's why we use the term grades of certainty. So there may be multiple grades of certainty of identity. Now, uh, I also cover apart from comparative dental identification, something called as unconventional methods of identification. And here I talk about denture marking. What are the different types of denture markers? And that it includes surface marking techniques, inclusion techniques, the different types of denture markers such as a stainless steel strip or clear acetate, or it could include uh, photographs of patients, 
which are embedded within the denture, or it could be RFID tags or barcodes. All of these are covered. And next I proceed to palatal rugae. So I try to define the palatal rugae, give them a basic classification and also show a case example on how palatal rugae can be used. But remember, such cases are few and far in between and therefore they don't warrant much time. And that's the reason all of these methods are combined and covered in one presentation. Mind you, denture marking and palatal rugae have use, especially in edentulous individuals, when teeth are unavailable. But when uh, these are also not present, that is when palatal rugae or denture markers also cannot be used, then we can try to look at frontal sinus patterns. The fact that uh, every one of us has a very unique configuration of frontal sinuses. That's something I show diagrams from studies to highlight its uniqueness. Similarly, cranial sutures, the fact that none of us, even identical twins, don't have similar cranial suture patterns. What's the way cranial suture types look? You know, they may be serrated, they may be squamous, they may be limbus, they may be plain, all of these in addition to the type of radiographs, extraoral radiographs that can be used to recognize and identify cranial sutures is also covered. Craniofacial superimposition. It can also be referred to as a skull photo superimposition, wherein we have a photograph of a person we think is dead, and we also have that dead person's skull and these two images are superimposed to see whether the eyes on the photo fit the orbits on the skull, whether the nose fits the nasal aperture, whether the lips and teeth on the photo fit the teeth in the skull, etc. Last, uh, uh, and some may argue, certainly not the least, is spatial approximation. And this is really, uh, uh, you know, something which is done when everything else fails. And I tell that very clearly to students, that uh, at best what we achieve through facial approximation is, uh, you know, a mixture of art and science. And uh, its intention is to elicit some memory in some person's mind about the face of a missing individual or a dead individual. So facial approximation is also referred to as facial reconstruction, although the word reconstruction is considered to be inappropriate, so facial approximation may be more useful to use. So these are the first two lectures uh, related to identification. And then I proceed to age estimation. So you see, age estimation is the only topic which is covered both in the third year as well as in the fourth year. And again, this is based on my experience and many other dentists' experience that a vast majority of cases, perhaps about two-thirds of all cases that we get, relates to age estimation. And this could be age estimation in children or age estimation in adults. Now, mind you, in third year, we had not really talked about age estimation in children and adolescents. We had only covered age estimation in prenatals and neonates and age estimation in adults. That's because age estimation in children and adolescents, which makes use of calcification of teeth, is something that should be covered under radiology. And therefore, I devote uh, some amount of time to that in this lecture. I also cover uh, eruption of teeth, but uh, you may be surprised that I don't really go into the details of eruption of permanent teeth. Instead, I restrict myself to talking about the eruption of deciduous teeth. Because research uh, has shown that 
eruption of deciduous teeth is what is more useful in age estimation because it's under greater genetic control. Eruption of permanent teeth is under proportionately greater environmental control and therefore it may not be ideally suited for forensic age estimation. So it's calcification of teeth which is more useful, more important. And therefore I cover uh, multiple methods of dental calcification in age estimation of children and adolescents. So basically we are looking at individuals who are maybe from about four to five years of age till about 21, 22 years old until the time their third molars complete calcification. But we also cover age estimation in adults here because there are certain uh, x-ray based methods that can be used in adults and this is what is covered as part of this lecture. Now this is as far as core forensic odontology is concerned and I next devote one hour to something called as dental jurisprudence. The lecture's entire title is Dental Jurisprudence and uh, Risk Management. What do I mean by risk management is how do we uh, try to stay away from the risk of litigation by patients? And of course, there what I talk about is the importance of maintaining dental records. You know, today, as per the Dental Council of India, every dentist must maintain dental records for a period of at least three years from the commencement of dental consultation or dental treatment. And uh, it also says that ideally these records should be digitized. So all of this is covered in this lecture, including uh, areas, relevant areas of consumer protection act, uh, rights of the patient, rights and duties of the dentist, what's the definition of negligence, and if negligence does occur, what is the civil liability as well as what is the criminal liability of dentists. Civil liability is basically where cases may be brought against dentists seeking compensation. But criminal liability is when, for example, death occurs patient on the dental chair. In such circumstances, a criminal case may be filed against the dentist, maybe. Now, there are a lot of laws which safeguard doctors and dentists against such criminal liability. But these are the issues that is covered as part of this one hour lecture. The fifth which I cover in uh, fourth year is related to some very uh, interesting and important cases that have been referred to me in Dharwad so that ultimately the students um, get an understanding of how all of this knowledge and skills that they may have learned over the course of two years, how it may finally help in the field, how it may help in terms of application in certain real life cases. So uh, that's the entire uh, set of 10 lectures which are covered in third year and fourth year. Of course, we are yet to finish uh, the practical aspects. So here uh, I cover uh, approximately three years of comparative dental identification. And uh, what's done here is basically a mock case wherein I give students dental models and these dental models have a variety of uh, findings which includes uh, filled teeth, missing teeth, maybe fractured teeth and the students are supposed to record these details on something called as Interpol post-mortem forms. These are standard pink colored forms which are developed by the International Criminal Police Organization. 
and then I also hand them the antimortem forms, the yellow colored forms. And the students are supposed to come the pink colored forms which they have filled up with the yellow colored forms which I have provided them. And they need to draw appropriate opinions on the degree of certainty of identity. And I also give details on certain report writing procedures. Now, this kind of an exercise would ideally need to be done in a mortuary. But going to a mortuary and exposing the students to a dental uh, post-mortem examination uh, would require a lot of resources, uh, uh, especially in terms of time, which may not be very feasible. I used to do this during my stint in Nepal because I used to work in a government institution there, which had a mortuary. And I used to take BDS students, third year BDS students, they being taken and they would undertake post-mortem uh, dental examinations there. But here, of course, considering we are in a private institution with perhaps limited uh, uh, autopsies being done in the mortuary, uh, therefore it may pose challenges, uh, uh, not just because we are a private institute, but also because of the time that it would take. So therefore, such mock exercises would give students the exposure to how these activities are done. Uh, and I tell the students very frankly that this is akin to your uh, undertaking your pre-clinical exercises, uh, whether it relates to crown cutting or classroom class to fillings. Remember, you would have done it on uh, mannequins and typhodonts. So this is something similar. So you get a feel of what needs to be done, but it's not being done on an actual individual. But uh, here again, the teaching needs to be done using both conventional and manual methods, along with the use of computer-based applications. The second and final practical exercise which I undertake and I advise for everyone else to undertake for fourth BDS students is X-ray based age estimation methods. I believe this age estimation methods would be a lot easier than the comparative dental identification exercises. And therefore it may take less than three hours. So it may just take two, two and a half hours also. And here uh, you can provide students with radiographs. Of course, make sure you have hidden the age. The students should not be aware of the age of those individuals. Let me assess. So what I do is uh, I give them x-rays of developing dentitions. So they assess this tooth development and then using certain standard methods and standard formulas, they estimate the age. And then I provide them with the actual age of that individual so that the students know exactly what's the estimated age and what was the actual age and how close have they been able to predict the age? What is the error between their prediction and the actual age? So that gives a real good sense as to how well they are able to use that method to assess the age. And uh, fourth year, of course, uh, in this exercise also, uh, I insist on certain report writing procedures. So both the exercises involve uh, certain basic report writing procedures because report writing is an essential component of forensic odontology. No case is completed without writing a report. So although this was not covered in third year, I believe now the students have sufficient maturity to start uh, venturing into this aspect of uh, the practical exercises and the age estimation exercise once again is uh, largely done digitally so there's very little uh, manual uh, application here because the graphs digitized i give it to them they assess it on the computer and all the calculations are also done um, digitally on their computer but it can easily be done uh, manually also, but it will take a little more time to do so. So this more or less covers uh, teaching forensic odontology 
in a practical way, both the theory as well as practicals in third year and fourth year. But over the last five years, I have uh, grown to believe that it's extremely useful to teach forensic odontology in internship also. And this was at the request of some of the interns, uh, probably uh, certain circumstances led to them uh, believing that they would want to learn more of forensic odontology. And there were certain details which were not covered in their third year and fourth year. Uh, and therefore, I decided why not cover those uh, missing pieces in their internship. So when I say elective program, remember, the intern voluntarily comes forward. And only if they prefer and if they request, this program is undertaken. Uh, and I usually spend not more than six days on these elective programs. Of late, it is about four days, so four to six days at the most we are able to cover. And so here uh, uh, we are looking at a much more detailed coverage of some of the topics which were uh, undertaken in the third year and fourth year. And it's purely practical. It's purely case-based. There's uh, no lectures involved. So whatever practical exercises I could not cover in the third year and fourth year, and there were definitely no case-based learning. Apart from that one lecture, there was no practical case-based learning. So these case-based learning is what is covered during the elective. And if I feel I have missed out on something from the third year and fourth year, which students would find interesting to know or useful to know, whether it's related to age estimation, um, it could be radiographic age estimation or morphological and histological age estimation. So all of these bits are covered. Anything that was missing from third year and fourth year is covered here. And perhaps the most prominent thing to be covered is bite mark analyses. Because apart from a couple of lectures in their third year, there was no practical exposure to students as far as bite mark analysis goes. And that's because it's uh, very time consuming. It needs uh, at least one full day. And by that, I mean about seven to eight hours to complete some of the basic exercises related to bite mark investigation. And it can't be done in two or three hour segments. That continuity is essential. Therefore, it is best done by sitting with the students from morning nine till evening five and to do it over at least two to three days. That's the best way to learn bite mark analysis. So a majority of this elective program is devoted to in-depth coverage of bite mark investigation. And uh, I think it is uh, very well received by the interns because what I've seen is over the last few years, the number of interns who have come forward and elected for this program has increased you know, every year. So the last year's batch of interns, there were approximately 80, 80 out of 100 who came forward to uh, undergo this elective. And of course, I usually prefer not to have uh, interns in groups of more than 20. Uh, occasionally, due to time constraints, I may have to increase it by uh, a few. But normally, the ideal number would be to have about 20 uh, interns or so. And I think if uh, other institutes uh, found this uh, something feasible, uh, they must also explore this option because the students are much more mature during their internship. They're able to learn and grasp things much better than when they were in their third year and fourth year. And you see, the students are learning this uh, voluntarily. So there is no pressure that it is part of an examination or part of a curriculum. So they are much more relaxed and they're much more comfortable learning this during their internship. So all in all, I believe uh, such an elective program would, would be a huge hit uh, provided the students have some basic exposure earlier on in their third year and fourth year. 
So to summarize my presentation over the last uh, uh, one hour or so, uh, as far as teaching of forensic dentistry to dental undergraduates is concerned, I believe we need to cover lectures and uh, complement these lectures with sufficient practical exercises. Ensure that uh, there's at least about 20 hours of training, 10 hours of lectures and about 10 hours of practicals in the third year and fourth year. Uh, but since it has to be covered in third year and fourth year in oral path and oral medicine, collaboration is absolutely a must. If you don't collaborate, that program will fail. Um, so that's as simple as I can put it, as simply and as bluntly as I can put it, it will fail if there is no proper collaboration between these two departments. So don't have any uh, false notion of being uh, the authority or owner of forensic odontology. So just uh, interest of teaching the subject so that the students gain the most out of it. And of course, uh, uh, I think you must also explore the option of an elective in internship. Remember the DCI curriculum gives the option of having electives in internship. So there's every possibility that this elective can be undertaken within the 365 days of internship. So I think uh, there is a good case to have such electives and these electives can be for about four to six days. So approximately about 24 to 36 hours perhaps. So, um, my thanks to Yenepoya Dental College, uh, Mangaluru, particularly the Dean, Professor Raktar Hussain, once again, Dr. Sudindra Prabhu, and others in the Center for Forensic Odontology. I know there are many who have been behind the scenes organizing this program. My thanks are also due to the IAFO, my parent uh, association of which I'm also a founder. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, consent to uh, being part of this uh, program, which I'm sure uh, many would have uh, gained from. And last but uh, not the least, my thanks to all participants from all around the country uh, for having logged in to uh, be part of it. Thank you once again, and I uh, welcome any questions that you may have. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. You want me to read out, sir, for you? or? Uh... Yeah, please. Please do, uh, Dr. Sudhindra. Yeah. Dr. Sridhar is asking, why can't we include rugoscopy and chiloscopy in practical demonstration, sir? Because uh, there's almost no real life application in forensic odontology. Um, I am not a fan of a little rugae or lip prints simply because I believe uh, there's very little practical application um, and uh, there's hardly any cases in which we use it. In fact, I'll say that I'll be surprised if anyone does more than a couple of cases of uh, in Italy? palatal rugae and lip prints and therefore I think uh, uh, a brief mention as part of one of the lectures should suffice. I think it's a waste of time undertaking practicals in this. So there is next question. Toxicology and forensic identification, can it be included in theory topic? Uh, absolutely. I think it's a useful thing to cover. And I think uh, it can involve forensic medical uh, experts also. So sure. In fact, I'll uh, encourage uh, dentists if they have a good collaboration with their forensic medicine departments to involve one of the faculty from forensic medicine to give at least a one hour lecture on some of the overlaps between forensic medicine, forensic toxicology and forensic odontology. I'm sure that will be extremely useful. And so the next question is uh, theoretical aspects of forensic photography. Forensic photography? Yes, sir. But that theory can be added yes. for photography. Yes, uh, I think I mentioned uh, 
a little bit about photography when I was talking about the lecture on bite mark investigation in third year BDS. And I said that I spent some amount of time talking about how photographs can be taken in bite mark uh, evidence collection. And this I give a demonstration during the elective that is organized for the interns. So yes, it must be included as part of one of the lectures, preferably as part of the bite mark lecture. And a demonstration can be included perhaps during the elective that's undertaken for interns. Sir, which all uh, specialties uh, in dentistry are eligible to teach forensic odontology for undergraduates, sir? Excellent question. FDI defines forensic odontology as that branch of dentistry, which in the interest of justice deals with the proper handling and examination of dental evidence and with the proper evaluation and presentation of dental findings. So remember the first line, Forensic odontology is that branch of dentistry. It belongs to all dentists. It belongs to all dental specialists. Therefore, I believe no one should and no one can claim ownership of forensic odontology. And uh, I know for a fact that there are so many pedodontists, so many endodontists, so many orthodontists who would be interested. So it would be a great disservice if we leave them out. So if there is an institution and that institution wants to establish a forensic odontology department, sure, you can go ahead and establish it. You can also include an oral pathologist and oral physician in that department. But if there are other specialists who are interested to be part of it and who have demonstrated experience, experience in terms of research, experience in terms of teaching, experience in terms of handling cases, it would be foolish to ignore them. Therefore, involve anyone who is interested in forensic odontology. Do not restrict it to just a couple of specialties. Sir, pulp tooth ratio by using radio uh, age, uh, for age estimation, whether it can be added in the curriculum? Uh, absolutely, it must be. And I do cover it in the fourth year. I don't cover it as part of practicals. I include it in the age estimation lecture in fourth year as part of a radiological method that can be used in adults. And again, the practical aspects I included along with case-based learning during internship elective. Again, if time permits, it can be included in fourth year also. But uh, for me, it suits me to include it in internship because I can really spend more time on it and give details on it. But yes, it must be included. And what about DNA extraction methods, sir? At best, maybe a little bit of uh, theory coverage, a little bit. What I have uh, uh, learned to an extent, I have learned in a rather disappointing way is that uh, DNA analysis does not require a dentist. You may extract DNA from teeth or blood or any other part of the body. You don't need a dentist to extract DNA from teeth. So therefore, DNA is DNA. You don't need to be a dentist to assess and analyze it. So just because it's DNA from teeth doesn't give us you know, the right or privilege to assess it. And therefore, we must, in my opinion, concentrate on those areas which no one else can do. So as far as morphology, radiology, histology is concerned, that is where our expertise comes in. So therefore, uh, practical demonstration of DNA extraction is a waste of time. Uh, it can be done in any forensic lab by a non-dentist also. So we don't have to uh, break our heads over it, but yes, cover a little bit about theoretical aspects. It's useful to know, not essential. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Manish Bhargav is asking, sir, what... Oh, sorry, let me just correct. It's, it's I'm sorry. important to know. It may be essential to know that you can extract DNA from teeth, 
for identification purpose. It's essential to know, not essential to do. That's my point. Okay, sir. Sir, Dr. Manish Bhargav is asking, uh, like, uh, which all textbooks do you recommend for undergraduates in with respect to forensic odontology, sir? Uh, I believe at an undergraduate level, they need not, they need not read textbooks of forensic odontology. They can just focus on existing textbooks that have chapters on forensic odontology. So there are both oral medicine and oral pathology textbooks that have chapters on forensic odontology. Hello, hello, one, two, three, my texting. So there may be dental anatomy textbooks also which have chapters on forensic odontology. So I think it's enough if they read these multiple chapters from multiple textbooks. I think that's more than enough. So whether a demergence method has to be included in the curriculum? Uh, since it is, uh, yes, as per DCI, demergence method is listed. And since the emergence method uh, continues to be the most widely researched dental age estimation method, I think there is a case to be made to continue its usage. Um, so yes, I will say one word, yes. Sir, this is a common question for you. Most of the time, this will be asked to you. Uh, the future of forensic odontology, vacancies, what is the future? Any other courses you can do? And how can you practice forensic odontology in your day to day practice? Sir? Uh, now, uh, uh, just to save on time, Dr. Sudindra, I will. Yes. Uh, tell all those watching that uh, there was an interview uh, which Dr. Mandana Donahue uh, uh, took of me and there I tried to talk about uh, you know prospects of forensic odontology so therefore uh, that should be available on LinkedIn Dr. Mandana Donahue is an oral pathologist herself and maybe I tried to give a link of that video to my website. Uh, I'm unable to do so yet. So details can be obtained from there. But in a nutshell, what I will say is that the future of forensic odontology is bright. And I think it is much better today than it was 15 years ago when I returned to India to pursue a career in forensic odontology. I think many who have completed uh, certificate courses or degrees Hello, Vikram, have, uh, have managed to get a job opening either in private or in government institutes. I think what's important here is that the school uh, should ensure that they have a proper qualification, ideally a full-time qualification, if they have not had a MDS. I think they must go for a post graduation in forensic odontology, which is full time in nature, either within India or abroad. Now, in addition to these full time qualifications, I think they must also pursue a variety of short term or part time training. For example, our association, Indian Association of Forensic Odontology, has a fellowship program. I think NFOYA also has a fellowship program. And there are many other other universities from around India, D.Y. Patel, People's University, I think Manipal, here in Harvard also. So all the part-time. So a mixture of full-time and part-time training will give them a lot of exposure and make them much more competent as, uh, you know, someone who can handle real-life forensic cases. Ultimately, remember, that's what's most important. Anyone who wants to pursue a career as forensic odontology should be able to handle real life forensic cases. So towards that end, you must have a good mixture of knowledge and skills and also adequate exposure to real life cases. Therefore, I say have a mixture of full time certification as well as part time fellowships of part time certificate. This is if you are dense without an MDS. If you are someone who's a dental specialist who has an MDS, then perhaps 
just one of these part-time forensic odontology qualifications would be good enough. Uh, because I think you already have an MDS that itself serves as a baseline and you're trying to gain additional knowledge and skills through these part-time qualifications. So that's my opinion. Um, I think there was a second part to that question, uh, Dr. Sudhindra. Uh, did I forget what that second part was? Uh, so one is the uh, future, next one is job opportunities, and third one, how you practice forensic odontology yeah. in your uh, you know, routine uh, ways. How, how to practice forensic odontology? Yes. Sir. Now, first and foremost, anyone who has a, a BDS is legally eligible to practice forensic dentistry. So you don't need to have any additional certification. So this is what I'm talking from a legal point of view. Anyone with a BDS is considered as a dental expert and can undertake and handle forensic odontology cases. And that's what many dentists in the government mm -hmm. sector do. There are so many dentists uh, in the government sector, in government hospitals, where cases are referred to them and they do it. And some of them have, you know, come forward and undergone additional training also. Uh, so uh, uh, if you are in the private sector, then you need to ensure that the police are aware of your qualification skills and that you can help them. So what I used to do is I would go and contact the police directly. I would go and approach police stations here in Hubli Dargad and all around the state. When I uh, used to go to Bangalore, I would go to the police headquarters, meet the director general of police. If I went to Mysore, I would go and meet the police commissioner. Say that, you know, this is who I am. These are the type of work that I can do. Uh, if there's any such case, you're uh, most welcome to refer such cases to me. So this is what I used to do probably 10 years ago. I don't do that anymore. But if you are a dentist in the private sector, I think that's what you need to do. Make sure that the police are aware of your expertise, of your knowledge. And in addition to contacting the police, I think you can also contact lawyers. Because you see, lawyers, you can either be lawyers from the prosecution side, you can also serve as lawyers from the defense side. Now, both lawyers will require expert witnesses. So if you have a government forensic dentist who is helping the police, the dependent also needs a dentist to counter that government forensic dentist. So, you know, that's what this adversarial system is all about. You have two lawyers, so therefore you need two forensic dentists also. So those who are in the private sector, although I have so far not been approached by any dependent lawyers. I have almost always been approached by the police and therefore my uh, expert testimony has gone towards the prosecution side. But, you know, I won't be surprised if the day comes when a lawyer who is defending an accused person also comes to me and says that, look, doc, that dentist is saying something. Uh, what do you think? So that's what private debts can do. So have linkages with lawyers. Uh, especially uh, criminal lawyers who serve as defendants, sorry, who serve as lawyers to defendants, and uh, they too will need the services of dentists. So yes, approach the police, approach uh, lawyers also, and uh, forensic medicine departments. Uh, it's very useful. It's very useful to have an association with forensic medicine department so that many cases come to them. And if they believe a case requires uh, a dental expert's opinion, they're the ones who will be able to refer it to that dentist. So these are the three types of professionals we need to approach. And then slowly over a period of time, uh, you may end up getting more and more cases. Sir, uh, there are a few more questions. Would like to take this or uh, shall we end the session here, sir? I leave it to you, Dr. Sudhindra. I have all the time. I'm happy to answer all questions. Uh, Fine, sir. You, uh, the next, as uh, uh, organizers uh, have the time, I'm uh, yeah. willing to no stay problem, with you. Yeah, no problem. Is the tongue print reliable? No. Tongue print. The tongue print. The tongue itself is a highly mobile organ. And you see, uh, one more reason why uh, lip prints and palatal rugae may not be very useful is because they are part of soft tissues, just like the tongue also. The foundation of forensic dentistry is teeth. 
the fact that teeth have been able to survive post-mortem insults, high-speed trauma, fire, decomposition, teeth by virtue of them being heart tissues have been able to survive all of this. And that's why in really badly damaged dead bodies, you've been able to obtain teeth and use them in identification. You know, use them in identification when soft tissues are not available. Therefore, soft tissues uh, have very little utility and value in post-mortem identification. So, uh, my dear uh, delegates at this program, teeth, forensic odontology is equal to teeth, heart tissues of the teeth, all the different tissues of the teeth. So, whatever research you want to undertake, my advice would be to focus first on the teeth. Sir, Dr. Srikant uh, Natarajan, uh, Professor HOD from M course Mangalore is asking, uh, how about including eruption sequence, which we teach in first videos during dental anatomy uh, and its forensic applications? Absolutely. You can, with the caveat that uh, are there standards for Indians? I think it will be very useful to have Indian standards. If there are uh, eruption sequence, related to Indians, and I assume uh, Dr. Srikant is talking about uh, permanent teeth. You can include it, but of course, make sure that you say that eruption may not be as useful as calcification. Uh, and I personally believe that calcification is what should be used in forensic age estimation. Eruption can be used if what for whatever reason we can't use calcification, only then as a last resort, eruption of permanent teeth can be used. Uh, like I mentioned, eruption of deciduous teeth, I think, is something that can be used. But uh, make sure that we have Indian standards to rely on. So the last question from Dr. Ramya, is there any textbook on DNA analysis sir, with, with respect to forensic odontology? Mm, nothing that uh, I can think of off the top of my head. If I can remember, I definitely convey this to Dr. Ramya, correct? Uh, I think my email address can be passed on to her. If I do remember, I will uh, let her know, but nothing that comes to my mind immediately. Thanks a lot uh, for your patience, sir, and uh, answering all the questions of the delegates. Now, uh, thanks for the wonderful my presentation. Pleasure, Dr. Yeah. Sir, we come to the end of the sessions. Thanks a lot for an excellent uh, presentation, sir. We would like uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Amara, to uh, deliver a of thanks. Over to you, Dr. Amara. Just before that, Dr. Ashish, it was a great lecture, and I enjoyed listening to it. And I think I'll try to introduce this in my college also. Uh, we should find time. That's the only thing. What we are afraid of is if... Uh, no administrator is there in the group, then I can say that they'll have to extend our uh, working hours then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you very much. Uh, all the best. Otherwise, it's a great one. I'm sure this will actually induce more students to take this as a speciality. It's a great lecture. Uh, so. And if you're doing this in your college, uh, what would be your the working hours for your institution? Uh, sir, our working hours here is 9 to 5, sir. So uh, nine to five. Okay. Yes, sir. It's a okay. standard workers we have around the world. So no okay. institution okay. no, no. follows that. But that's not the same in many institution. And uh, I think we better not discuss that here. Thank you, Sidindra, <laughs> for organizing this program. That part probably I'll discuss with you later. We'll try to introduce this. Only thing is, like I told you, the time factor. Time factor. We'll try to do something about it. Thank you, Ashif. It was great. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks a lot for your input, sir. Thanks a lot, Balgopur, sir, for your input, sir. Thanks Thank for you. attending. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hope uh, no more questions and clarifications. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Dr. Amara to deliver a vote of thanks. Over to you, Amara. Thank you, sir. A warm and graceful morning to all the attendees. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the presence and contribution of each and everyone present here today. First of all, I would like to thank the management, Yanapoya deemed to be university, for their unstinted support for all the activities of the Center for Forensic Odontology. 
A special mention to our beloved Dean, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, Founder Secretary of Islamic Academy of Education, for being the catalyst and that stimulated us to do our best and standing as pillar of strength for all our endeavors. Thank you, sir. My heartfelt gratitude towards all the office bearers and members of the Indian Academy of Forensic Odontology for their extended support towards our center. I would fail in my duty if I did not mention the name of Dr. S. Balagopal, President and Founder Secretary of IAFO for his support. I would also like to thank Dr. Shivapatam Sundaram, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Meenakshi Amal Deemed to be University for his gracious presence for today's webinar. On behalf of our center, I also extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our resource person, Dr. Ashit Acharya, who spared time from his busiest schedule to address the attendees. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts and precious information regarding forensic odontology, and this will surely encourage us in our future events. Thank you, sir. My gratitude to all the vice principals, head of the departments, and faculty of Kanapur Dental College, and all other attendees of today's webinar. An event like this cannot happen overnight. It requires planning and a bird's eye view for the details. Hence, I would also like to thank my team members, Dr. Sudhindra Prabhu, Center Head Forensic Odontology, and Dr. Syed Migdat Tangal for their stupendous efforts towards webinar. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Where is the feedback form? Sir, a link is available uh, in the chat box, sir. We, I will copy it again for you. All of you, please uh, provide the feedback. The link is available in the chat box. Ashish, sir, thanks a lot uh, for a wonderful lecture, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Sudhindra. Once again, my thanks to everyone involved, including uh, Dean Akhtar, sir. Uh, I'll uh, get back in touch with you shortly, uh, Dr. Sudhindra, once you're uh, relatively free from this program. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Good day. Have a nice day. Thank you all.